get some music, yeah. Oh, I am. Okay, thank you. I'm live. <laughs> Unlike Francisco Franco, who is still, as near as I can tell, seriously dead. All right. Um, two major uh, pieces of New, uh, New Deal, Great Society legislation that elementary and secondary school, like the other one, more familiar, I think, to us and probably less reason to talk about it, would be Medicare and Medicaid which takes on the issue of health care. Um, millions of Americans uh, didn't have health insurance, especially the elderly. Uh, Medicare was established at first for the elderly, for people 65 and over. And um, ironically, it was a congressman, Wilbur Mills uh, from Arkansas, uh, who later lost his position because he was found consorting with an Argentine uh, exotic dancer. Um, that has a lot to do with this course. Uh, uh, Wilbur Mills was in a generous mood, so he added poor people to it. He added the Medicaid program, which brought in people who were uh, below a certain income. And uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Medicare program has really become the benchmarks for the Great Society. These occur in 1965 at the same time, for example, that the Voting Rights Act is occurring, Civil Rights, which we'll talk about later. This is really the heyday of the Great Society. They've addressed, you know, many of the fundamental issues and the most important ones at the time, which were education and health care. There were clearly crises in both. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? No one's saying that in the 90s, right? Um, in addition to that, they created an AFDC program, Aid to Families with Dep Dependent Children. Uh, Johnson establishes HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, to address the um, uh, housing crisis in America. They create urban renewal projects where the federal government will send money to, you know, essentially wipe out neighborhoods and put up uh, places like Cabrini Greens. Uh, not a terribly successful program in, in many ways. Um, the Motor Vehicle Safety Act brought in on large measure by pressure by Ralph Nader and others about the uh, uh, unsafe uh, automobiles being made. So for the first time, the federal government begins to regulate that. Uh, creates a Department of Transportation um, and so on. And you could go on and on and on and on and on about the war on poverty. Um, so the war on poverty then clearly is an attempt to address these problems and it's based on the idea that the United States has the power and the means to do so. The war on poverty though occurs at the same time as the war in Vietnam and these two things as Johnson says will run in a convergent stream. Um, in 1965 for instance, a uh, uh, coincidence or not, in July of 65, the very same week that LBJ decides to uh, Americanize the war to send all these troops to Westmoreland, uh, a couple bills, uh, one I think was for home rule in Washington, D.C., another one was a funding bill for, oh, I can't remember, it may have been another education bill, were stopped. They were voted down in Congress. So Johnson points out that in that same week, these two things really kind of hit home. And the war in Vietnam is starting to take away from the war on poverty. Now, uh, I don't want to go into great depth about this. This is something that you know historians and others are still grappling with. The traditional, almost conventional wisdom now, and LBJ himself said it, was that Vietnam kills off the Great Society. Johnson said that whore of a war, Vietnam, killed the lady I love, the Great Society. Um, there's another school of thought on this, one which I find actually fairly compelling, which basically talks about the limits of reform anyway. And I'm not real sure, and I don't want to go into great depth on this, that the Great Society didn't do everything it could have done anyway. To go beyond creating programs for education and health care like LBJ did would have at some point required sending money and power to people at a grassroots level. And there was an attempt to do that in something called CAP, Community Action Programs, where they actually, instead of sending money to bureaucrats to administer it, sent it to the people themselves in need. And what did they do with it? They created tenants unions and they had rent strikes and they registered welfare mothers to vote and things like that. That actually threatened the political status quo. So I'm not sure even without Vietnam if the Great Society would have done much more than it ended up doing. But the fact of the matter is it occurred at the same time as Vietnam. And there's no question that Vietnam in 1965 especially and thereafter replaced America's domestic issues as the dominant uh, uh, crisis in U.S. life. Up to that point, up to 65, it was civil rights. It was King, the March on Washington, 
the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. In 64 and 65, along with that, you see the war on poverty, great society, education, health care. All of those things are part of this mix, this stew that's going on and on and on and on. And, and Johnson is spending money and making a commitment to deal with racial problems and poverty and health care and education. And then, boom, on top of all of this, you have this massive war. And pretty soon, all of these other things are basically orbiting around the war. They used to have, you know, kind of, uh, you can tell I'm an astronomy major. You know, they used to kind of be planets unto themselves. And now they're just kind of dancing around this big Vietnam War, right? So these things really do run in confluence. There are other things in the mix, too. This is a real complex period. And it's hard to talk about it quickly, but at the same time, you don't want to go into deadly, dull, detail, although I don't think this stuff is dull at all, actually, but you don't want to go into too much intricate detail because then it gets away from you. But this stuff is occurring at a very complex time, just as, as we'll talk about later, civil rights is going on, there's a war on poverty going on. There's also youth rebellion occurring, and this is going to have a great deal to do with the anti-war movement, which we talked about earlier. It's kind of funny because you think, where should I start? Should I start with the anti-war movement? Should I start with civil rights? And these things are so integrated, they're so interrelated, that you can start with any of them and they're all going to tie in one way or the other. You can do it chronologically, you can do it thematically. Basically, there's such an integration of movements here. The student rebellion, the great society, civil rights, that no matter where you start, you're going to say, well, he should have started somewhere else. Or you can say, you can start anywhere because they're so deeply interrelated, which is the point of all this. The war affects everything, right? At the same time, then, that there's the Vietnam War, the War on Poverty, Civil Rights, there's also a youth rebellion best demonstrated. There are a lot of things going on at this time. Counterculture is a good example of that, which we'll talk about. But this is best demonstrated by two groups, FSM and SDS. FSM stands for the Free Speech Movement. And this is a phenomenon of UC Berkeley. SDS stands for Students for a Democratic Society. This actually is all over, but it starts at the uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. All right. Once again, my perfect handwriting. All right. Free speech movement. Um, free speech movement actually gets started <clears throat> 1964 at Berkeley. Uh, outside the main, main administration building, which was Spruill, ha Spruill Hall, blah, 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 uh, students were passing out leaflets and flyers. And there were all kinds of student groups were there. Um, the Goldwater Youth, the, the Socialists, the Yippie, you know, whatever, the Yippies were around. Just anybody could, you know, so it wasn't just, you know, kind of left wing radicals. It was, you know, the Youth for Goldwater, who was running for president in 1964, were there too. Um, this is outside the UC main gates. Um, the UC Berkeley system was already fairly well established as kind of a, a mecca for student radicalism. Uh, for example, in 1960, there had been major protests with several hundreds of students to protest uh, the House Un-Americans Committee, HUAC, which was conducting uh, uh, witch hunts, basically. They were going after so-called subversives in San Francisco. Um, so. You know, Berkeley already has a history of radicalism, of activism. In addition to that, the president of the UC system was a man named Clark Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. And Kerr believed in the UC system as a, quote, multiversity. Instead of a university, he called it a multiversity, meaning that students would be educated, the university would have its traditional mission of teaching, but it would also have intricate ties to the corporate and political communities. So the university no longer is just a place isolated with, you know, ivy walls to educate students, but it is in fact kind of an education factory, a knowledge factory with the corporate community, with the government. So you develop contracts and R&D contracts and R&D uh, uh, laboratories to get Pentagon funding and you do consulting for the Department of Defense or for the CIA or whatever. Clark Kerr said the university and segments of industry are becoming more and more alike. As the university becomes tied into the world of work, the professor takes on the characteristics of an entrepreneur. Okay? 
and I'll be selling my CD after class, uh, all right, uh, in the, along those lines. Um, so uh, uh, Clark Kerr then becomes kind of a poster boy for uh, the students as kind of the faceless bureaucrat. Uh, Kerr, for example, allows Billy Graham to speak on the UC campus, but then when students invite Malcolm X, uh, uh, Clark Kerr refuses to allow him to speak, uh, basically claiming that uh, you know he was a radical, but in fact, you know, uh, uh, Billy Graham was a religious leader too. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kerr claimed that it obviously it was because Malcolm X was a radical. Kerr claimed separation of church and state. They point out, well, you let Billy Graham speak, how can you not let Malcolm X speak? Uh, university administrators at that time had a, a, a uh, principle called in loco parentis, which you may remember. No? By then? Good. Uh, Oh no, Corey, when were you in school? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Okay, yeah, by then it's, it's pretty much being dwindled away. And loco parentis means in place of your parents, which means that the university can do things that your parents would do, set curfews and ground you and stuff like that. Um, and this is the general university's roles. Uh, they would restrict dormitory visiting hours and they would not let you pass out pamphlets outside Sproul Hall, for example. So, Ultimately, this gives rise to the creation of the free speech movement, the FSM. Basically, they're tired of the university telling them that they can't pamphlet or whatnot. And in September of 1964, various groups, including the Youth for Goldwater and the Socialists, began to protest this ban on uh, uh, leafleting and pamphleting. And you know, this goes on for some time. Pretty soon, arrests are made. This is in the fall of 1964. There's a good documentary on this called Berkeley in the 60s, by the way. In the fall of 64, they find that they arrest people for making talks and whatnot. Uh, at one point, uh, police pull up to break up a rally, and the students surround the police car, and they all get on top of the car, and they make speeches. It's the free speech movement. We have the right to say anything we want. They take their shoes off. They're very polite. They get on top of the police car. The police are, you know, for a long time, they were in the, in the car, which is kind of funny. Uh, uh, football players and the fraternity boys come out, and they start throwing stuff at the demonstrators. It gets kind of ugly for a while there. Um, what, what, does the, what do the liberals say about this, about the free speech movement? Seymour Martin Lipset, a name you may be familiar with, a, f a fairly well-known intellectually still writing today, uh, claimed that the free speech movement was, quote, like the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, I never quite could understand that one. Clark Kerr said 40% of the participants in the free speech movement are tied in with organizations having communist influences. So they red bait these people. So liberals, now these are liberals, Kerr, Lipset, these are liberals. These aren't, these aren't right-wing nuts coming out to get them. This isn't Reagan. Reagan's not governor yet. Pat Brown is. So the liberals are going after the free speech movement. They arrest the main leaders. One of the leaders of it uh, uh, is a man named Mario Savio. Uh, and like the speech by King, uh, Savio gives a speech that day that, that I think every student should be familiar with. Um, he stands up. He's a working class kid math student he says there's a time when the operations of the machine become so odious make you so sick at heart that you can't take part you can't even passively take part and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels upon the levers upon all the apparatus and you've got to make it stop and you've got to indicate to the people who run it to the people who own it that unless you're free the machines will be prevented from running at all an incredibly powerful uh, speech Mario Savio gives, which kind of becomes one of the, the mantras of the 60s among student groups. Does he say anything about Vietnam? In it? No. 1964, no one really is aware of it yet. It's, however, very critical. The type of issues and ideas raised by the free speech movement, who will determine what our goals will be? Who will determine whether we can go into our dorm rooms? I mean, student radicalism begins with fights over parietals, actually. Parietals are rules that the university makes regarding like visitation. You can't have girls in your dorms or they're on equal parietals. Like if a, a male and female were caught together, the female might be kicked out of school. Uh, for example, the, uh, Tom Hayden's first political uh, issue actually was uh, uh, an editorial in the uh, Ann Arbor newspaper, the University of Michigan newspaper, against the dean of women who was reporting back to parents the names of young students, female students who were getting birth control pills. And the, the, this dean of women is reporting their parents, your daughter's on the pill. And so Hayden wrote an editorial against that. Yeah. They wanted me to sand all of the wooden doors in the stalls of the boys' bathroom on the second floor of Scott Hall. 
I refuse. They wanted you to do what? They wanted me to sand down all sand the graffiti them. off of the, oh, the oh, toilet okay. stalls <laughs> or having girls in my room. Yeah. But I refuse. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. I mean, these are parietal rules. So this is how a lot of these people got started. It wasn't about civil rights or Vietnam. It was about dorm visitation rights. It was, you know, basically treat us like an adult. And so, I mean, you know, Savio doesn't say anything about Vietnam, but the rhetoric there, the words there, the images, you know, the machine, this is going to be really critical to the anti-war movement because these kinds of ideas, this imagery, that this government is a big machine, it's impersonal, it's impassable, we have to put our bodies upon it and stop it, is going to become a trademark of the anti-war movement. I mean, people will literally get on tracks and stop troop trains. It's not at all unusual. I mean, in Oakland, there were demonstrations against trains carrying uh, uh, soldiers to the base there. I forget which base it was. Would, would that be uh, Fort Bragg? There's a Bragg in Northern California. It was Travis Air Force Base, which is where everyone... Oh, okay. It was Travis Air Force Base, which is where everyone left from to right. go to Vietnam. Okay. And I mean, you know, people would literally throw their bodies on the tracks and stop the troop trains from coming in. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing Savio was talking about. So this is really critical to, to send this idea out. Uh, the free speech movement, uh, ultimately, after much haggling, um, the free speech movement essentially wins. And they are allowed to leaflet. The university uh, basically repeals its restrictions on that. Right? So, and people, students all over the country, not just at Berkeley, are aware of this their college newspapers are covering it and whatnot. And so the free speech movement becomes very well known inter uh, nationally. College kids all over are aware of this. And they start to see the same possibilities on their own college campuses. And again, it doesn't start with big issue. You know, the Vietnam War, civil rights or anything like that. It starts with parietals, uh, censoring the school newspaper, uh, the dean of women sending the names home of students who are on the pill, stuff like that. And in short order, I mean, really, within a very short period of time, parietals are essentially ended. You have co-ed dorms. Uh, for example, if uh, a male and female are caught together, it used to be that the male might you know, be suspended or have some kind of bad conduct mark, but the girl might be kicked out of school altogether. There are now more equal punishments and things like that. So in a very few years, this, this student rebellion actually chalks up a great deal of success. And then, then we'll move on to other issues. But it, without those fights over things like parietals and the censorship of student newspapers, the anti-war movement doesn't have you know, perhaps the same heritage or the same vitality it did before. It's interesting because thinking about my freshman year, in, this was in 69, that's exactly the, the progression. That yeah. was the progression. It, it went from uh, uh, about having to wear coats and ties mm -hmm. to dinner and have, then having to do ROTC, and then it moved on to, to all-out you know, anti-war protest and, and those kinds of things in Cambodia and everything. Where, where were you at school? In uh, Ripon College in Ripon, Wisconsin. Oh, that's right. I asked you that. Yeah. Which is actually if considered a, that's a very fairly liberal place. Yeah. And it's the birthplace of the Republican, Republican Party. Party right. have a log cabin there. Yeah. So, um, uh, and this is occurring not just at big state schools like Ann Arbor or Berkeley, but, but all over. Ohio State, I don't know if UH had anything like that going on. But, um, but this becomes something of a national movement. And it does, it starts, I mean, you know, people get kind of activated or politicized or they get a consciousness over the fight to have a girl in their dorm. But that actually has an impact. That's not just pure hedonism. That actually has a political meaning to it. Treat us like adults. Or who are you to make laws for me? And it's not that much of a leap, is it, from saying, who are you to tell me what I can pass out to uh, why are you having this war? Why are you trying to draft me to go to war? I mean, this is the same attitude. And Savio's speech, I think, is really eloquent in that regard. You know, the system has become so odious. And he's talking about pamphlets. Okay, you can say, oh, that's overkill. But, but look at what happened after that. You know, I mean, he was in, you know, maybe it's overkill. Maybe he's exaggerating. Maybe he's a prophet. You know, that's another way to look at it, too. But what he said, I think, was really a powerful statement. Um, so the free speech movement really, I think, is important for kind of laying some groundwork. Uh, in terms of institutional importance, probably SDS would be more important. Um, overall, we often refer to these groups as the new left. This, this is kind of hard to, to explain or describe because the new left was a name basically given to a bunch of people and a bunch of things. There never was a new left organization. Institutionally, it was decentralized, fragmented. That's the way they wanted it. In fact, students were afraid of centralized bureaucratic institutions like the Multiversity or like Clark Kerr. Uh, 
So they wanted to keep things fragmented and decentralized. So when you say new left, you almost think like that there's a new left, a group. But in fact, the new left could encompass virtually anybody who in some way took on the system. The free speech movement, new left, sure. SDS, which we'll talk about, sure. Civil rights, in many ways. Yeah, civil rights movement, especially after 1965, could be considered part of the new left, although there were clearly distinctions there. Women's liberation, new left, why not? I mean, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Eco, you know, environmental activists, new left, sure. So the new left is really this amorphous idea, as much as anything else, that, well, two things. One, the system really needs to be fixed, and two, the old left has failed. What was the old left? Labor unions, socialist groups like that. Why have they failed? Because they were co-opted. They were bought off. Anti-communism became their mantra. And so the new left was based on the idea that communism is not the issue. For a long time, the government has been able to charge people with being communist or make them base their loyalty upon the issue of communism, and therefore they prevented real reform. McCarthyism and things like that. Whenever somebody has some idea for liberal reform, you accuse them of being a communist, the whole thing dies. So the new left says, unlike the labor unions, unlike the socialists, unlike the Americans for Democratic Action, unlike liberal Democrats, we don't really care about communism. That's not our, that's not our thing, you know. Uh, we are anti-anti-communism. We are going to focus on what's happening here at home not on the specter of Soviet intervention or anything like that. So the new left says the old left has failed and they've never created a real alternative. So America doesn't really have a, 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 a diverse political system. You know, it's not a system where um, you have all kinds of ideas represented. In fact, it's a very narrow system uh, and there's no left to really be represented in it. And it also argues that, um, as I'll get to soon, that the liberals tend to be the real problem. The new left doesn't see, you know, kind of uh, uh, the right wing as being the major problem. Their major problem, in fact, for them is, is liberalism itself, which I, which I will get to. So all of these things are part of this amorphous new left. And among the new left, probably the group best known is SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. If you want to fold civil rights in as part of the new left, then I would say the most important group would be SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But generally, we tend to see civil rights as being something somewhat disparate from that. I think SNCC and SDS are the two most important youth-oriented student groups of that period, hands down. And they are working in essentially different areas. Although SDS, as we'll see, gets started not doing Vietnam work, but in fact, dealing with the issue of participatory democracy. SDS gets started 1962 in Port Huron, Michigan, where Tom Hayden and others get together, and Hayden writes a, a little manifesto called the Port Huron Statement, uh, which starts, we are people of this generation bred in at least modern comfort, housed now in universities, but looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. They believe that Americans had become complacent they had become too self-satisfied. Uh, the 1950s, the kind of leave it to beaver, father knows best ethos was hopelessly outdated and it wasn't addressing reality. Um, they called for a commitment to social justice. Many of them were inspired by the uh, fairly young at the time and growing civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. Hayden, for instance, in 1960 went to L.A. And along with Martin Luther King, marched uh, in a protest against the Democrats at the Democratic Convention that year, where JFK was nominated. Uh, the Democrats, remember, even though later they would be considered the, the party of black Americans, were actually the party of the South. Until fairly recently, there was very little Republican Party in the South. So the Democrats were always the party of segregation. George Wallace, Ross Barnett, Orville Faubus, they were all Democrats, they weren't Republicans. So it was only natural then for King and these people to target the Democratic Party. And Hayden was part of that. Many of these young white activists were part of that. They come back to college and they call for a new commitment to social justice, to civil rights, to human rights. And it goes beyond simply King and the issues that African Americans have in dealing with apartheid in the United States. They put at the core of their ideas participatory democracy. They believe that the political system actually in the United States was practiced from the top down. 
that democracy to in America meant that you could vote. But what did it mean beyond that? Were you voting for candidates you chose? No, essentially. They're saying this in the 1960s, 1961, 62. You're voting for candidates that corporate America has picked. And this is before the PACs and zillion dollar campaigns and things like that. Already at that point, this is part of their critique. Um, we're given voting privileges. We're given free speech for the most part. But we're actually discouraged from participating in the system. So if we have a complaint, what are we told? Well, write your congressman. You know? Uh, or, you know, or even more than that, if we have a complaint, what's generally the attitude? Well, are you a communist? It's really easy to red bait somebody who disagrees with something, right? So this is the core of, of SDS's idea of participatory democracy. Yeah, we're allowed to vote, but we are actually discouraged from participating in the system. Who participates in the system? The corporate and political elite do, but we don't. The people don't. Labor unions do, but are labor unions terribly progressive institutions? They would argue no, that in fact labor unions have been pretty much bureaucratized and had gone through their own and bourgeois men process. Do labor unions have a particularly good record on hiring minorities and women? No, not at all. In the 1960s, labor unions tended to be protective organizations for white men. They would lobby for and usually get laws to protect their jobs against immigrants or blacks or women or so on. I mean, the unions after World War II wanted women to head back home and have babies as much as anybody else did because they wanted these guys to get their jobs back. So the new left then would say that there really isn't any institution to encourage rather than discourage popular participation. They want a participatory democracy, not a virtual democracy or simply a voting democracy. They want people to have a significant role, a voice that will be heard in the decisions that will affect their lives personally. They want young people, poor people, uh, white, black, uh, people outside the mainstream to have a voice in America's political and civic life. Okay? In some ways, they want, obviously, legislation to make sure that blacks are allowed to vote. They would lobby later, you know, uh, there was no movement for lowering the voting age to 18, but clearly that, they would be in favor of that. So in some ways, it's, it's actually stuff that you can measure, a law making life or making political life more participatory. But in other ways, it was more of, a, of an ideology. We need to stake our claim as citizens to, you know, this system. We have a right to have a real voice that has to be heard, not simply to ratify through elections decisions that have already been made for us. So this is part of the, the SDS rap, okay? I kind of sound like I'm in a DA, DEA uh, uh, thing or something, the SDS rap. Uh, SDS issues the Port Huron Statement, uh, and from that point on, they uh, begin uh, recruiting and organizing at various campuses. By 1964, about 80 different campuses have SDS chapters. SDS's first actual attempt to do something is not, has anything to do with Vietnam again. Actually, they are going to do with the issue of poverty. And they are going to create, it's an ugly acronym, and you don't have to know what it stands for. If you want to, you can email and I'll put it out there. Uh, it's called the ERAP, Economic Research. Actually, I have to look it up because it's one of the uglier acronyms I've, I've come across now. Economic Research and Action Project. I always want to say activity. ERAP, Economic Research Action Project. Basically, it's fairly simple. The goal of ERAP, which is an SDS program, is to send student organizers. What kind of students? They're going to be middle class white kids, both male and female. Females actually play, women play a very important role in, in SDS, actually. Uh, at the same time, when we get to the roots of women's lib, we'll also see the limitations of that. But they send white kids, middle class white kids from places like the University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, Oberlin College, Rennie Davis, places like that, from fairly well-to-do families, well-to-do institutions. They're going to send them into the inner city, in big cities like Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Louisville, Newark, Philadelphia, all over the place. And they will create programs where these fairly well-to-do middle class white college kids will work with local communities there and try to organize them. They want to create what they call an interracial coalition of the poor. They want to bring together poor whites and poor blacks, poor Mexican Americans or Latinos, wherever they happen to be. They want to create an integrated, organized movement of the poor. And these SDS students in ERAP are there to facilitate it. 
for example, in Cleveland, which may have been the best Arab city, uh, a woman there, Sharon Jeffrey, who was a founder of SDS, I believe, from Ann Arbor, organized a tenants union and a welfare rights organization. This is the kind of thing they do. But what happens when you organize a tenants union or a welfare mothers organization, which is some of the stuff Arab did? Well, the city, every police department has a red squad, a squad that goes out hunting for subversives. And leaders of the tenant union or the welfare rights organization usually in major cities would be harassed by the Red Squad. You know, if you don't quit that, then we're going to cut your, you know, relief payments or we're going to throw your, your husband in jail or whatever, that kind of stuff. So IRAP is really swimming against the tide. They're trying to organize the poor. Now, who is, who is responsible for the repression? It's the liberals. It's not, it's not Ronald Reagan. It's not Richard E. Nixon, as Archie Bunker would say. It's the liberals, because who controls most of the big cities? What party? Democratic Party does, overwhelmingly. I mean, again, it's only recent that a Republican could possibly get elected in any big city, in er any urban area. These were part of the Democratic Party strongholds. And so uh, uh, the local red squads and political pressure come down. In addition to that, these students don't really speak the same language as the people they're trying to organize. They're over there talking about Karl Marx and Gunnar Myrdal and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, stuff like that, you know, high sociological theory and Michael Harrington. And these people want to know what their lives, you know, how this is going to help them in their lives, not what the teachings of Marx or Gunnar Myrdal are. So IRAP has a rough road to hoe. And by 1965, not doing all that well. But 1965, something else comes along, okay? the Vietnam War. And SDS essentially, essentially shifts away from working in the issues of participatory democracy, uh, interracial coalition of the poor, and becomes an anti-war organization. It calls for the first national march in April of 1965. And, um, essentially begins to organize many of the anti-war activities of that period and many of the leaders of the anti-war movement, Hayden, Oglesby, Potter, come out of SDS. Vietnam then radicalizes the new left. It, more than anything, radicalizes the new left. The free speech movement, civil rights, which we'll get to, SDS, all of these groups by 1965 begin talking about the limits of liberal reform. And they come up with a concept which is going to be real important called corporate liberalism. All right? The typical liberal state, which we've talked about, speaks of issues like reform, uh, the need to address inequality. These are part of the liberal, this is part of the kind of the liberal stereotype, right? Somebody who wants to help the poor, somebody who wants to help minorities, somebody who believes in women's rights, somebody who believes in protecting the environment, right? This is kind of a, it's kind of a feel-good type thing, okay? This is generally how liberalism is, is identified, but um, the new left changes that, and they create a concept called corporate liberalism. Actually, several historians were among the first people to do this, William Altman Williams and Gabriel Kolko. Uh, Chomsky later will use the concept of corporate liberalism. Uh, uh, people would talk about limousine liberals. Yeah, you talk a good game, but then you get in your limousine and you head back to your gated community. You know, uh, the best example, as I said before, was Phil Oak's song, Love Me, I'm a Liberal. If you've, if you've ever, never heard it, you should. Um, you know, the refrain is, you know, uh, stuff like, uh, da, 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 I, I cried when they shot Medgar Evers, tears rolled down my spine. Uh, I cried when they shot Mr. Kennedy as though I lost the father of mine. But Malcolm X, he had it coming. He got what he asked for this time. Love me, love me, love me. I'm a liberal. And it's along those lines the whole time. It talks about how labor unions are becoming anti-communist. Uh, I love Harry and Sidney and Sammy. I hope every colored boy becomes a star, but uh, don't let him move in next door. So it's this really derisive, mocking song about liberalism. And this really, I think, you know, sums it up beautifully. It's really a perfect way to learn it in about three and a half minutes. Um, from another Phil Oaks fan, right? Who yeah. quotes the power and the glory. Uh, that's, well, I'll talk about Oaks later, actually. He's really, really an interesting, really one of my favorite characters, a very tragic figure from that period. Um, the idea there in the New Left was that these liberals are a bunch of fat cats. They're hypocrites. They talk the talk, but then they don't walk it. Right? They talk about helping the poor, but they won't give up anything of their own. So they developed a concept of corporate liberalism. What is corporate liberalism? 
the idea that corporations and major wealthy elite are behind reform, but it's a reform for their own good. Corporate liberalism isn't, let's help the poor, let's be idealistic. Corporate liberalism means we want reform because it will help us. So when I talked about the Peace Corps, the idea there is that if we send young people to develop, to create development in foreign countries that are underdeveloped, if we can teach them to, to uh, immunize their children, if we can create schools, then we will have an infrastructure so that American companies can move in there, so that they can buy the stuff that we make here. This is the critique of liberals called corporate liberalism. Right? And as part of that, Vietnam really is uh, kind of a, uh, um, a benchmark. The Vietnam War to the new left is evidence of how corporate liberalism is actually conducted. The war comes along at a time of great growth. They would argue that Vietnam is part of the traditional liberal mission. The United States has to go abroad and get involved in foreign interventions like Vietnam to send a message out that you don't mess with us. And so this critique takes on a, a great vitality within the new left, this idea of corporate liberalism. So the enemy becomes liberals. Why? Liberals provide a barrier to effective change. Sure, liberals can pass laws saying it's okay for blacks to vote and to eat at a restaurant that used to be white only. But does that in any way shift power? Does that in any way distribute income or, or resources into the black community? It's the old saying among, among black critics was, yeah, now we can eat at the restaurant, we just can't afford to pay the bill there. We can check into a hotel, but we can't afford, we, you know, we're allowed to check into a hotel, but we can't afford to. So the idea then is to legally dismantle this system of apartheid or to legally make health care education available to the poor, but never to distribute resources or power to the poor. So that, for example, if you organize a tenant union, it's going to get shut down by the local Red Squad. Why? Because that goes beyond liberal reform to actually having grassroots activism. And corporate liberals do not like that. Corporate liberals are people who still believe in the corporate system. And JFK was quite candid about that. I mean, the, the current system is, is clearly similar. I, you know, I, I have to admit, my own personal opinion I, is, is, is shock when people accuse Bill Clinton of being a radical or a socialist or something like that. I mean, do these people really believe that stuff? I mean, Clinton is the most Wall Street friendly president ever. I mean, if you look at the, in terms of legislation that the banking and finance industry want, if you look at it in terms of his own personal relationships with people like Robert Rubin, if you look at it in, in, in the way he's reached out to get campaign contributions from bankers, no president, Reagan and Bush included, has ever been more Wall Street friendly than Clinton has. Right? And in the same way, Kennedy was quite candid about that. Kennedy's talking to businessmen and he said, you, we're all on the same team. Our, our, the, the, the role of the government and the role of you people is the same. Your fortunes are tied to ours. If you succeed, we succeed. It, how is that different from Calvin Coolidge saying, you know, what's good for business or what's, you know, the, or Charles Wilson, what's good for GM is what, what's good for America. Or Calvin Coolidge saying the business of America is business. This is corporate liberalism according to the new left. I would argue that that is their greatest accomplishment. Organizationally, the new left SDS never really amounted to much. It was fragmented in terms of numbers, Maybe 10,000 students ever actually belonged to SDS, maybe more, but even so, it was never anything but a fairly small fraction of college students. But this concept of corporate liberalism, as we'll see, becomes fairly powerful. People like Bobby Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King take, up, take it up, and that becomes part of their rap in 1968. The idea that the liberals, the Democrats, have abandoned us. All right? There's no difference. They're Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And in some ways, people today like Pat Buchanan and Ralph Nader are talking the same way. I mean, there are other great differences, especially in Buchanan's case, just, you know, he happens to be, you know, like a neo-Nazi, but other than that, you know. Um, so I would argue that that's really part of the, the crucial element in, cor in, in the new leftist corporate liberalism, right? And you see that, you know, it, it, uh, among real fights, you know, really then within the, the liberal establishment over this. Uh, you see it at Berkeley, you see it in SDS, you see it at Columbia in 1968, there's a big student protest at Columbia, right?
So all of these things are occurring at the same time as Vietnam, and Vietnam becomes really part of that process um, um, by making students question the system, first on a fairly local level. Why should they tell you who you're allowed to have in the dorm? Why should they say you can't pass out, vote for Goldwater leaflets? Uh, is this really a participatory democracy? Okay, from that level you go to, what's this war in Vietnam about? You know, why are Americans fighting there? Is this part of maybe something bigger, a bigger process? And so all of these things converge, and, and I think this idea of, of uh, corporate liberalism really becomes quite important in, in that uh, uh, period. Um, even though LBJ uh, clearly speaks about reform and engages in, in uh, things like education and health care reform, uh, there are limits to what he is willing and able to do. And quite often, the poorest people don't actually have access to health care. Uh, for example, um, if you look at uh, people reached by Medicare or Medicaid, uh, most poor blacks never get it, never get access to Medicare or Medicaid in the 1960s. So quite often the people who needed it most really were, were kind of left out. And the new left would charge this is all uh, an example of, of corporate liberalism. Okay? And the war, of course, has a great deal to do with that. There's a great convergence, again, of the war on poverty, great society, and the Vietnam War. Okay. Maybe even more importantly, this is occurring, the war is occurring, reform is occurring uh, on the issue of civil rights. And um, again, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, and one of the reasons in the reader I included in the Martin Luther King speech was because it is so succinctly really nails these issues, I think in a very uh, brilliant way. Um, in fact, the book I just mentioned, the one on Vietnam in the 60s, I open with a, a discussion of that speech by Martin Luther King that is in The Reader. Um, you probably are fairly familiar, you should be, with this history of civil rights up to that point. Um, the modern civil rights era, as we often refer to it, we quite often refer to it, begins around 1954. And if you have to pick you know, a, a starting date, it would be the Brown versus Board decision. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1954 declared that segregated schools were unconstitutional. So um, now the federal government says that you can no longer have a school for black children and a school for white children because the school for white kids is, often, is always going to get more funding. They're going to have new books. They're going to have heating, you know, whereas the school for black kids is going to, they're going to have inferior books. Um, they're going to have broken windows. They're not going to have heat in the wintertime and that kind of thing. This is actually the case. So uh, the Supreme Court says you can't do that anymore. Does that change things? No, because the Supreme Court doesn't give a deadline for anybody to act upon it. It says do this with all deliberate speed. So for example, um, in 1957, uh, nine blacks, eight black students tried to get into uh, Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the governor refuses to let them in and, and sends the National Guard out. Finally, to trump that, Dwight Eisenhower, president has to federalize the National Guard to let the students in. Okay? So this thing is not going to occur easily without a great deal of grassroots activity. In 1960, students who were kind of fed up not just with the people in power who were preventing them from having civil rights, but also fed up with the mainstream civil rights leadership, people like Whitney Young from um, uh, the, the, the Corps and, and uh, Roy Wilkins from the NAACP. They're fed up with them too because these guys are moving too slowly. They essentially take the law into their own hands and they begin going into segregated lunch counters and sitting down and ordering food, trying to order food or drink. And of course they're refused and they're put in jail. This is the sit-in movement. And national leader most closely identified with that becomes Martin Luther King. King had first made a name for himself in 1956 during the uh, Birmingham bus boycott, uh, Montgomery bus boycott, I'm sorry. Montgomery, Alabama, blacks were forced to sit at the back of the bus or stand up and give their seat to a white person. And of course, Rosa Parks refuses to do so, and blacks boycott the bus system for over a year. And King leads that, and he first makes a name for himself nationally. And he is the most important national figure to support the sit-ins of the 1960, 61, 62 period. And King himself is thrown in for jail, into jail for sitting in, in, in Georgia uh, at that time. So he. Um, 
you wouldn't call him, a, I don't know if you'd call him a radical or not, but he's certainly more militant and more active and maybe more aggressive or assertive at least than the mainstream civil rights movement would be. King also has a larger critique. I mean, clearly he's a civil rights leader, but Martin Luther King had a PhD in theology. He had written his dissertation on Walter Rauschenbusch, who was a progressive minister, active in something, with something called the social gospel. The idea that, you know, religion by itself doesn't mean anything unless you put a social context into it. You, you put it to social purposes. You help the poor, you help organize unions, you help feed the poor. Or, 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 you know, more than just actually, you know, praying and feeding the poor, you actually like organizing a union or protest or demonstrate, that kind of thing. So King comes out of that tradition. King also has a critique of American society. Martin Luther King called himself a democratic socialist, small d, small s. He had profound problems with capitalism and often wrote about them. I mean, King was red baited all the time. He actually, one of his major aides was a communist, Stanley Levinson. So King was often um, attacked as being a communist himself. Um, and uh, he was a critic of the capitalist system. He called himself a democratic socialist. So King then is able to see much larger uh, connections. And throughout this early period, uh, on one hand, clearly he is concerned with equal rights for blacks. And that culminates in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act and 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And you go through <clears throat> the whole litany, the Birmingham and uh, Mississippi Summer and SNCC and Freedom Rides and all that. I mean, you, you should be familiar with the, the major uh, incidents in this period. By 1965, Martin Luther King has won the Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> He's been Time Magazine's Man of the Year. He is one of the more famous Americans. And in general, uh, among white liberals, he is very popular. Why? Okay, well, on one hand, he's not Malcolm X. Okay, he's not threatening. He's well educated. He's very polite. Uh, I mean, I know this sounds like the, these are the stereotypes of the time. That's why I'm saying it. These are what I believe. This is kind of the impression people would have of King. He's, you know, quite often they would use the phrase a good Negro to describe him. LBJ, who in public would put on, you know, a, a great show, would say, yeah, he's my boy. Uh, and he would use the N-word quite frequently. There's a Chad Mitchell Trio had a funny thing where before a song, they have uh, LBJ saying, uh, Dr. King will be, or no, no, they, they have LBJ saying, okay, practice it again. And he's using the N-word. And finally, he comes out with Negro. And all of a sudden, you hear, okay, Dr. King, you can come in now. Okay, so this is LBJ. But publicly, at least, he could identify with King. I mean, King wasn't threatening. Why? Because what he was asking for could be given without a sacrifice. What's he asking for? Is he asking for jobs? Is he asking for health care, housing? No. Basically, what the early civil rights movement was asking for was legal recognition, equality, constitutional equality. Let us vote. Let us eat at a particular lunch counter. Let us check into a hotel. Let us use the same water fountain. Right? Access. These were questions of access. Let us ride the buses. Let us sit down on the buses. All of this can be done at no expense, basically. You know, you're not spending anything per se to do this. This is not going to require any kind of federal program. This is simply going to require an enforcement of law. So King is fairly safe. This is, these are not radical demands. To vote? I mean, what's more fundamental than that? To be able to eat at the restaurant of your choice, what's more fundamental than that? So by 1965, King is very popular. He's, he's well accepted. And among liberals, I mean, Martin Luther King can go to a, a Manhattan cocktail party and come out with thousands of dollars in contributions. Whereas Malcolm X could never do that, right? And there is a critique of King within the black community because of that. They claim he's too familiar. He's too comfortable. He's not radical or militant enough. But King did see the connections that were going on. And he did understand that the government up to 1965 had simply recognized what was the constitutional and moral thing to do. You know, give them voting rights, giving civil rights act. But King didn't think that that was the end of the line. He thought this is just the start. And this is where he comes into problems, and this is where Vietnam becomes so important. In fact, in 1965, King, speaking at Howard University, says, the war in Vietnam is accomplishing nothing. In July of 65, this is when Johnson sends the troops there, right? He sends the, the major troop commitment there in July of 65. King says that there should be a negotiated settlement with the National Liberation Front. So he is actually one of the earlier mainstream critics of the Vietnam War. 
He doesn't speak out on it too much because he doesn't want to alienate the Johnson White House because his major goal is still civil rights, right? Reporters in 1965 asked him why he was speaking out against Vietnam. And he says, I'm much more than a civil rights leader. And in fact, Vietnam does affect domestic political issues. So King himself in 1965 sees this convergence as being damaging to civil rights interests. Others go further. Eldridge Cleaver, one of the founding members of the Black Panther, says those who most bitterly oppose Negro progress are also the most ardent advocates of a belligerent foreign policy. Basically, he's tying in people like uh, uh, John Stennis and uh, Mendel Rivers, southern legislators opposed to civil rights pro-Vietnam. He sees them as part of the same problem. Stokely Carmichael, SNCC. Originally, he was uh, one of the uh, founders of SNCC, the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, later known to the world as Kwame Ture. Uh, Black Panther founder, too, said that uh, LBJ talks all that garbage about he's sending boys over there to fight for the rights of colored people. You ought to know that's a lie, because we live here with them and they don't ever do a thing for us. Stokely later came up with the great line, the Vietnam War, let's see if I can get it right, the Vietnam War is about white people sending black people to kill yellow people to defend the land they stole from red people. Okay? <laughs> so there's a real line there. There's a real line of argument, a rationale for blacks to oppose the war. <laughs> Actually, I could have quoted it from my notes, but instead I had to do it from memory. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I.F. Stone, radical journalist, says, um, points out, in 1965, the United States had 150,000 soldiers in Vietnam. In all of the South, they had 150 voting registrars. Okay, there's a real connection there. The U.S. seems more concerned with equality and freedom and human rights and all these buzzwords in Vietnam than it does in Mississippi. Um, it gives rise, again, I mentioned this before, to Stalin's famous interchange with uh, Roosevelt at Yalta when Roosevelt keeps saying, what about Poland? What human rights in Poland? Elections in Poland? What about Poland? What about Poland? And Stalin draws on his pipe and says, oh, what about Mississippi? And this is the same thing that these people are pointing out, blacks are pointing out. Freedom and democracy in Vietnam, how about a little bit here? Okay. Uh, Malcolm X was outspoken. I mean, again, the war in Vietnam, Malcolm was assassinated in February of 65. So the war hadn't really taken shape, but he had already become outspoken against it. And even just the limited commitment the United States had up to that point. So you see that already. Uh, there is an exchange, an interplay. Well, this becomes quite pronounced later on. Uh, after 1965, after the Voting and Civil Rights Act, King himself has a new agenda. All right? And it actually, initially, it takes on a couple different um, forms. First, King has an economic agenda. Now that blacks have the right to eat at a restaurant or they have access to public transportation, they have to get jobs with decent wages to pay for that. Black unemployment is much higher than white unemployment. Black youth unemployment is tremendously higher than white unemployment. Um, housing is very poor. Uh, blacks live in the poorest sections of America. So King changes, the, you know, he transforms. I don't want to say it's a change. It's, it's an evolution, actually, from things like constitutional guarantees of voting rights or access rights to economic rights. So the movement now becomes more economic oriented. It goes from constitutionality of a particular issue to the right to have a job, to have housing, to have health care, and so forth. Right. Now, what does LBJ and the white establishment think of Martin Luther King? They're starting to get a little worried about him because he's starting to sound a little bit too radical now. He's starting to sound like Malcolm X, or he's starting to sound like uh, all these crazy kids in SDS. He's not using the term, near as I can tell, I've never seen him use the term corporate liberalism. That's exactly, though, if you look at what he was saying closely enough, that's exactly what he was talking about. Right? Uh, there is a great deal of speculation among scholars whether, had they both survived, King and Malcolm X would have come together. And, I mean, if you look at the rhetoric of both of them at the times of their deaths, it is starting to sound somewhat similar. Malcolm is softening some of his earlier rhetoric and looking at kind of uh, what he calls, I think, an a movement of the oppressed, a pan, not just a pan-African movement, but an, a movement of all peoples, not just black, but white as well. And King, toward the end, is becoming more militant. 
never advocating violence, but nonetheless seeing all poor people as having a stake. He becomes far more than a civil rights leader. He becomes a leader of the poor. So there is something of a convergence there. So King becomes a critic. So on one hand, he's talking about economic issues, which the white liberal establishment doesn't like. And on the other hand, he becomes a major critic of the Vietnam War. And that speech is quite powerful in that regard. Uh, I, I have it on tape, and when you hear it, it's, it's even more incredible to actually hear him talk. You know, we're, we're sending white boys from Georgia and black kids from Detroit to fight and die side by side when they would never be allowed to sit at the same table in school, in a school in the United States. They fight and die together, but they can't live together here. All right, we're making war on a yellow people in the name of democracy, but do we have it here? Uh, just tremendous. I mean, his knowledge of the war is, is fairly significant as well. Um, I mean, you guys read that. What did you, you think of it? And was, was there anything in there that, you know, kind of struck you or, or, or stood out? Why? Okay. The, it's, it seems like we all take that for granted. Yeah, of course. What King said was the truth, right? Why was he so vilified at the time? He gives a speech, ironically, I think you know this, on April 4th, 1967. What happens exactly a year later? He's killed. All right. Um, why was he so vilified? What did he say in that? What did he say in that that was so, so frightening or dangerous? Push the. You know, he talked about capitalism and the whole structure of wealth production was, you know, sickening the society and pushing. He, he calls the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, a society gone mad on war. He points out that to kill an enemy soldier in Vietnam, the United States was spending $150,000, I forget what the amount of money, tremendous amount of money to kill an enemy soldier in Vietnam. In the United States, it was spending $54 on every black school kid, and much of that money was going to bureaucrats. So it's beyond the war. He's talking about the system, right? This, this whole system and how, how slanted it is, right? I mean, when King comes out, this is essentially the break with the, with the liberals. They, they disown him at that time. He's no longer their boy, as LBJ would put it. Um, I'm waiting for Oliver Stone to actually do something on the, the King assassination, because I think if you ever find any kind of weird complicity or conspiracy, that would be the one I'd look at far more than the Kennedys. Because King clearly, I mean, the FBI had been tailing him for years. They had uh, bugged his hotel rooms. They had transcripts of phone calls, transcripts of nights in hotel rooms with women other than his wife. They had tried to blackmail him. They had tried to, uh, they, they told him he should commit suicide rather than embarrass the movement. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was out to, to get him. Uh, and, and, and after coming out against the Vietnam War, he becomes hated. I mean, we all think of King, you know, it's kind of ironic. If you ever want to ruin somebody's legacy, you, you praise them and make them official. And so now we have Martin Luther King Day, McDonald's celebrates the dream, and so on and so forth. And an important legacy of King's life, one which I'm sure he would point out, was that he was one of the most, if not the most, hated man in America in 1967 and 68. All right? Southern whites always hated him. And white liberals weren't all that thrilled with him anymore either because he had turned against Vietnam. He had started criticizing not only their uh, policies in the South, but northern racial policies. He said, if people, in if people in Mississippi want to learn how to hate, they ought to come to Chicago. In Chicago, he was attacked. There were mobs in Cicero coming out after him. Right? So King is not terribly popular among northern liberals anymore. A lot of younger blacks have trouble with him because they still don't see him as being militant enough. I mean, to the point where you'll have Black Panther sometimes, Uncle Tom in him. They'll, they'll call him an Uncle Tom because he's still advocating nonviolence. King writes a, a powerful book in 1967 called uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Uh, just stunning, uh, where he talks about black power, this emergent black power movement, the idea that, okay, we got civil rights and voting rights, now we need power. We need economic power. King actually, you know, he says, strip away the rhetoric and this talk of violence, and I'm all for it. King talks about capitalism in very stark terms. The system has failed, right? It creates priorities which put the needs of corporations and uh, uh, weapons producers ahead of the, the needs of people. I mean, it's a damning, an incredibly damning indictment. And so Martin Luther King really, in one person, and in this speech, I think, encapsulates the convergence of Vietnam with these other movements, how one takes away energy and time and a commitment from the other, how one exposes the hypocrisies of the other.
in April 1968, King was killed. At that time, about a third of the casualties in Vietnam were African American. About one third of the American soldiers wounded and killed in Vietnam were black. Blacks accounted for about 12% of the population. This is a stunning disparity. The numbers went way down after King was killed because it was becoming too obvious and a lot of units in Vietnam were on the verge of, of racial, ri racial war. I mean, there, there were cases, a lot of cases of racial incidents in Vietnam. I mean, he pointed this out. Why are we dying and fighting in higher proportions to the white community? When whites start to take casualties at a greater rate, again, it's going to be southern whites disproportionately taking on the biggest losses in Vietnam. It's a poor person's war. King will point that out. He will expose that. Why should poor white kids and poor black kids fight and die together when they don't get to live together here? They would never live on the same block. They would never go to the same school. Right? I mean, I think in, in that, I don't know how long it is, about 10, 12 pages. It's about a 45, 50 minute talk. I mean, in that short period of time, he just encapsulates this connection, this interplay, this intersection of these two major national developments, civil rights reform on one hand, the Vietnam War on the other, and how one will necessarily kill the other one. And I mean, if you, if you have to look at, uh, again, I mean, as I said before, if I had to only pick one thing that people could take out of that era, if, you could only, if I could only teach you one thing or you would only read one thing, it would be that speech. I mean, that's easy. That's an easy call for me. I mean, more than Chomsky is the responsibility of intellectuals because that's dealing with a fairly narrow group of people, you know, what professors and intellectuals and media have to say. But King's talking to everybody, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an incredibly remarkable yet accessible way. So, yeah. Well, it's also, it's remarkable now because of, like you say, the way that his legacy has been uh, yeah. mainstreamed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's celebrated for his achievements in gaining access, mm -hmm. which I mean is a, has been a major improvement, I think, in American life. It, but, but nobody thinks of him in terms of the ideas that are in that, uh, in that speech. Oh, no. In fact, when, you know, when King's great speeches are cataloged or when you read a newspaper article, I mean, it was a profound order and incredible. I mean, no one you know, I, in my lifetime I've ever heard can speak like him. It's the March on Washington. You know, I have a dream or I've been to the mountaintop the night before he's killed. Those are speeches of conciliation. They're very powerful. I want young black, they're very optimistic. They're very positive. No one ever mentions the April 4th speech because in it he is saying some very profoundly disturbing things about American society. Uh, I mean, the most disgusting thing I think I saw was when I lived outside DC and in 91 or 92 they had the DC Lotto celebrates the dream. The Washington DC Lottery Commission was celebrating Martin Luther King Day. Maybe King would have, I don't know, maybe he wouldn't have had any problem with that, but I can't believe that he would not have found that profoundly disturbing given the way the, the poor people disproportionately play the lottery. They can afford it less and, you know, they play it. And, you know, generally you lose when you play that thing. Yet, I mean, he's become so mainstream. Actually, Skip Gates had a piece of long ago in The Atlantic or The New Yorker about that, how King has become everybody's Martin Luther King. Everybody has a piece of him now. He's become, in a sense, vanilla. You know, he's just drab, average, whatnot. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if we look at the principles that, that King and, and others like him were standing on, it really actually had nothing to do with color. It was about injustice and that it, in this culture and in this society, we find disproportionately that those people who, who are on the receiving end of the in, injustice and oppression are, in fact, people of color. But I, I, I really think that, that King's issues were, it was about poor people, it was about injustice, and that he always was everybody's Martin Luther King. I think that perhaps the way that he was um, PR promoted and covered in the media, and the fact that, again, disproportionately, it was it, it became or the focus was as an African American issue, but you know poor people in America <coughs> come in all sh in all shades, and that you know his issue was about you know access and equality for uh, 
for everyone, access and equality, particularly for the poor, you know, to be able to uh, to share in this this so-called, you know, American dream and all. I, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. What was King doing when he was killed? What was his major... Garbage worker. The garbage man, well, he was there on a garbage worker strike, which was a labor issue, and what was he trying to organize at the time? 1968, the mid big organizing push? The Poor People's Campaign. Mm -hmm. King was one of the few, maybe the only person in America who could talk to poor blacks and dirt poor white farmers in Appalachia. He could go to an Indian reservation. He could talk to migrant farm workers. King could reach out to poor people all over. Right? And I think more than anything, this terrified the establishment. They put every barrier they could in his way. This, this really frightened them because he had the potential to be a radical leader. I agree with you. He was a spokesman for the poor. My point is that I don't think he's remembered that way. I mean, I guess I would disagree with you on that count. I think he is seen as an advocate of the desegregation of the buses and whatnot. And, and he was obviously a great champion of civil rights. But I think he was a radical, I mean, he could be seen as a radical representative of the poor or of human rights as well. And there it is. It really was about human rights. I agree with you, yeah. but I don't think he's remembered that. And my point was that I think he, I think things like the speech, this speech that you've read, are very disturbing. Which is why that's not really part of the mainstream legacy he has. The mainstream legacy is not terribly threatening. It's not threatening at all, is it? I mean, who could be against blacks and whites sitting together on a bus? So when we hear about King, we hear about the March on Washington or the Montgomery bus boycott of Birmingham, and, and he's almost, in some senses, he's kind of a victim getting beaten up and pummeled, but he's doing it nonviolently. But I, I mean, the, the public persona I, I get, and maybe I'm wrong, is that we're not going to talk about this guy who says the United States is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world today. I don't see McDonald's doing, you know, America celebrates the man who said that the United States is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world today. I'm just talking about the, I mean, I think, I think this is interesting from a historical perspective in the way that we can take people who are very critical of the system and really adapt them to be part of it. And I think they've done that to King. I think the, if they haven't, they'll do it to Cesar Chavez or, you know, people like that. I think it's, yeah. One more um, observation uh, that's also not talked about that much. Um, you know, the perception is here that, that Martin Luther King was more moderate, Malcolm X was more radical, and they had kind of a symbiotic relationship with each other. Oh, sure. I think they, and they both were aware of it, oh, yeah. that part of the reason King was more effective was because Malcolm X was out there. Mm, oh, absolutely. You know, you can, you can deal with me or you can deal with that guy. Mm -hmm. but, but when you really look at it in terms of King's commitment to nonviolence, that's... Maybe the most radical concept of all. You can kill me, I won't. I won't take up arms against you. That threatens the whole basis that nations have for armies. Yeah. There is nothing more radical than that concept, and he lived his life devoted to that principle. That's the same reason Gandhi terrified the British. Absolutely. I mean, because you've taken away their whole reason for repressing you, essentially. There is no coercion, you know. Yeah. I mean, you take away the coercion card, then it's like, okay, yeah. kick my butt. That doesn't change anything. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, I, I, I see King as being a fairly radical and passionate defender, not just of blacks for civil rights, but for all people. And I think Vietnam really crystallizes that, the Poor People's Campaign. I mean, it was directly tied to ending the war in Vietnam. I would go so far as to suggest that the, 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 a lot of the urban riots could be directly linked to the war in Vietnam. Uh, Detroit, Newark, Watts. There were clearly local conditions that set those off. But they also spoke, I think, to this increasing commitment to a war far away at the expense of needs at home. So I think that there is an element of Vietnam in all this stuff going on. And I think, I mean, if you look at not just King, but I mean, especially even more, Eldridge Cleaver, Huey Newton, Stoke Carmichael, Rap Brown, I mean, they're always talking about the war. And what's one of the, uh, one of the more popular posters in college dorms in the 1960s is Stokely saying, hell no, I won't go. Who among black men is undoubtedly among all the world over the most famous person in the world in the 1960s? Muhammad Ali, right? I got nothing against them Viet Cong. And his famous words, which again were on post all over, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger, right? Again, the connection between civil rights and the war.
uh, there was a great deal of anti-war organizing and draft resistance in the black community. Uh, the Black Panthers did, did quite a bit of that. So there's a real convergence there. I mean, people see it. People get it. LBJ might not get it, but a lot of folks otherwise get it real, real quickly. And so, I mean, this comes home. You cannot talk about Vietnam without talking about this. It's just two, two halves of the same walnut. I could go on, obviously, forever on this. Anybody have any last questions on it? Because I do want to move on and actually like, get them. Go ahead. Actually, Muhammad Ali was just quoted in the paper last week. Somebody asked him, oh. yeah, what's the, what do you think is the best, most important thing you ever did? He said, refusing to go to Vietnam. Well, good for him. Good for him. OK. Uh, you know, you often wonder, because he's hanging out with Warren Hatch now, what he's up to. And that's good. Um, no, I think he was the most famous, probably the most famous person in the world in the 1960s. And he terrified the system when he did that. I mean, oh, Lord, I, I think, you know, between King and Ali, there was this real fear among whites that, the, you know, the revolution was imminent. And it seems really silly to say that because in retrospect, of course, it was nowhere near it. But people were genuinely frightened by this specter of black America rising up, you know, led by all these hotheads like Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali. So... Uh, and which is funny, of course, because you point out King was committed to nonviolence. He was deeply and profoundly put off by, you know, the black power movement because of its rhetoric, not because of, basically agreed with what they said, basically agreed with their analysis. But, you know, the idea of, of violence, I mean, he was obviously committed to nonviolence personally and philosophically. He also thought it was stupid to talk this because if it ever came to that, you'd get crushed. You know, the police and the army would come out and zap you in a minute. Okay, any, any last thoughts or questions? I mean, I'm free to entertain. I just want to get on because, like, Richard Nixon hasn't even become president yet. We haven't even talked about the Tet Offensive yet, okay? Which is cool, which is good. Tet? <laughs> Why not? Um, the Women's Liberation Movement, how, what's that have to do with the war in Vietnam? Actually, I think it's, it's connected as well. Um, women had been uh, um, very active and the two major reform movements, civil rights and the anti-war movement. In the earliest days of the civil rights movement, there really was an interracial coalition in the early 1960s, groups like SNCC or CORE. A lot of white northern college students would go down south in Mississippi summer or during the Freedom Rides, and they would work together with black students in groups like SNCC. And a lot of women participated in this as well. Now, after 1965, especially when this kind of black power ideology becomes more pronounced, you start to see a splintering within the civil rights movement and many white students, I mean, and, and SNCC kicks out white students. So whites then gravitate anyway because SDS and is doing this toward the anti-war movement. And within the anti-war movement, women have a very important role to play. Uh, women are very active in the movement, even though they cannot be drafted themselves at rallies and at demonstrations. Women are very pronounced. One of the most popular signs at the time held by a woman is girls say yes to boys who say no, advocating draft resistance, among other things. Um, women, however, find that on the new left, these are the good guys, right? They're the guys who are opposed to racism and they're opposed to war. They're advocates. They marched in Selma and they, they went down for the Freedom Rides and they're opposing the war in Vietnam. But on the questions of, of sex and gender, they're no different than, than any other man, okay? Basically, all the guys are the same. This is what these new left women are finding out. Uh, although women are very active in the anti-war movement, when it comes time, for example, to actually set policy, the men do it. What do women do? Well, they're supposed to make coffee and run the carbon machine and, of course, sleep with the men who are involved in the movement. If they don't, they're uptight. So women are finding out on a very intimate level and on a political level then, that even on the left, they are considered secondary. So you have cases where a woman will try to speak at a meeting and, and they'll, she'll just be ignored. I had a woman speak in my class last year who was in Berkeley at the time and went to a, a meeting. Uh, I can't remember which group it was. And basically had her hand up for like an hour, and they would never call on her. And finally, about an hour later, some man says what essentially she was going to say, and everyone said, oh, it's a great idea. And I mean, you just stories like this are, you know, so common. Or a woman will go up to a podium and try to speak, and a guy will yell, take your clothes off, or, you know, show us your whatever. And these are the good guys, allegedly, right? So women finally just get fed up with that, and you see a shift away from that into their own groups.
Uh, SDS, for instance, uh, has this mock cartoon in, in something called New Left Notes, which was a journal of the left, where they show uh, a woman uh, uh, with like a bikini on saying, we want our rights and we want them now, just mocking her, being very derisive about it. Women in groups like uh, SNCC and SDS circulated manifestos and pamphlets talking about the role of women. And they said to the men, you're no different than white people oppressing blacks. Your role or your ideas toward women are colonial. They're imperial, just like you would claim white men are toward blacks. And they just went nuts over this. So within the movement then, women are considered secondary. They're not given positions of authority, even though they're vital. I mean, if you look at any anti-war rally, there are clearly going to be as many, if not more, women at all of them than there are men. They're the ones making the signs, making the posters, organizing things, they organize daycare, doing a million things at once. Yet the men in the movement just don't really take it seriously, they don't engage it seriously. So what, what is the role then of Vietnam? Vietnam creates an anti-war movement, and women within that movement have to seek refuge on their own. Now, Vietnam doesn't create the women's liberation movement, but again, it helps serve as a conduit through which people will pass on to another issue. Women in the New Left find that the men in the New Left are basically pigs, like they would argue probably all men are. Okay? So this makes up for the uh, one about uh, Madame New and the gun, right? Okay? Women holding guns. Okay? So uh, uh, they will have to move beyond SDS and the Anywhere Movement to create their own groups. And in these groups, they will deal with issues that affect them uh, based on gender rather than on other things like the war or civil rights. Okay? Um, we've gone through a lot of this. I'll talk a little bit more about women and the counterculture, and then we'll talk about Tet and Richard E. Nixon, as Archie Bunker would put it. And pretty soon the war will be over and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye to all. Thank you.